Two years had passed since the terror of the Blitz had scarred Britain, and its people were beginning to breathe a sigh of relief. The storming of Normandy's beaches and the relentless pushback of the Wehrmacht in the east signalled a turning tide against the once invincible Third Reich. British citizens, once haunted by the nightmares of relentless bombardment, were finding solace in the belief that the worst was behind them. However, the shadow of Hitler's wrath lingered, ready to unleash a new kind of vengeance upon the United Kingdom. Without warning, Britain plunged back into a maelstrom of fear. On June 13, 1944, the skies over Grove Road in Bow, London, birthed a new horror. A mysterious object descended, annihilating a railway bridge and its surrounding homes, claiming civilian lives, injuring 30, and leaving 200 more without shelter. The onslaught continued. On November 25, 1944, a Woolworths shop in Deptford, London was obliterated by another enigmatic weapon, snuffing out over 160 innocent lives. A fresh and relentless blitz was ripping through the British Isles, sowing chaos and despair. These new bombs, unfathomable in their speed and destructive power, were not delivered by German aircraft. They traversed great distances autonomously, slicing through the skies at speeds that defied the era's understanding, rendering interception impossible. Hitler had unleashed his terrifying V-weapons, V for vengeance. The British populace, along with their leaders, were swept into a renewed state of vulnerability and terror. With up to 100 V-1 flying bombs raining down daily and the even more devastating V-2 rockets wreaking havoc, Allied leaders confronted a grim reality. These advanced weapons, unchallenged, could potentially tip the scales of war back in Germany's favour. In a move of desperation, the Allies made a pivotal decision. Partially setting aside their relentless bombing campaign against Germany, they initiated Operation Crossbow. This daring mission was a race against time to locate and obliterate Hitler's V-weapon launch sites and manufacturing facilities. If these technological terrors could not be stopped in the sky, they would be thwarted before they ever took flight. Yet the task was daunting. The Allies soon discovered not two or ten, but over fifty research facilities scattered across Europe's expanse. Distinguishing them among thousands of German military installations seemed an insurmountable task. All seemed bleak until British intelligence pioneered an innovative approach. Advanced 3D photography promised to uncover the hidden V-2 launch sites. Now, perhaps, the first weapons of mass destruction in history could be stopped. Hitler had a strong interest in advanced and innovative weaponry. The V-weapons, particularly the V-2, the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile, represented a leap in military technology. Hitler was keen to exploit this technological edge to its fullest potential. The V-weapons were not just military tools, they were also psychological weapons. Hitler hoped that the indiscriminate and unexpected nature of these rocket attacks, especially on civilian targets like London, would demoralize the Allied populations and governments, potentially forcing them to seek peace on terms favorable to Germany. The use of these advanced weapons served a propaganda purpose for the Nazi regime as well. It was intended to showcase German scientific superiority and military strength, reinforcing the regime's image at home and abroad, and continuing to foster the idea of German superiority. In 1944, American and British bombers intensified their aerial onslaught on German cities, such as Hamburg, Lübeck and Dresden. These relentless bombing raids, often indiscriminate in nature, wreaked havoc on both military and civilian targets. The destruction was widespread and catastrophic, leaving a trail of devastation that included historic structures and resulted in numerous civilian casualties. This brutal campaign was epitomized by Operation Gomorrah, a name poignantly borrowed from the biblical city destroyed by divine wrath. The operation saw no distinction between military and civilian structures, indiscriminately pulverizing everything in its path with a ferocity akin to the ancient tale of fire and brimstone. Al Murray, in his show Why Does Everyone Hate the English, referred to a stark admission from a Royal Air Force bomber command official. The official's words were chilling in their candor. Quote, the government, for excellent reasons, has preferred the world to think that we still held some scruples and attacked only what the humanitarians are pleased to call military targets. I can assure you, gentlemen, that we tolerate no scruples. This statement lays bare the ruthless strategy employed in these bombing campaigns. In response to this devastating aerial assault, Adolf Hitler, incensed by the destruction of German cities and the mounting civilian casualties, sought retribution. 
He ordered the immediate deployment of Germany's secret wonder weapons, developed since the conflict's onset. These weapons, known as Vergeltungswaffen, meaning retaliatory weapons, embodied Hitler's intent to avenge the Allied bombings. The V weapons program was a direct counterstrike to the Allies' devastating campaign. However, this decision to resort to V weapons came at a significant cost. Vital resources, critically needed on the front lines and other key war industries, were redirected to support this program. Despite straining Germany's war effort, the psychological impact of the weapons was profound, briefly rejuvenating German morale amidst looming defeat. The V-2 rockets, a cornerstone of this program, were produced in substantial numbers. From 1943 to 1945, over 5,500 V-2 rockets were constructed. The rate of their deployment was staggering, with nearly 100 rockets launched daily since the first struck Paris in November 1944. The impact of the V-2 rockets on Allied cities was both deadly and demoralizing. They claimed the lives of 5,000 to 9,000 military and civilian personnel and inflicted injuries on approximately 30,000 people. This destructive capability of the V-2 demonstrated the horrific potential of these wonder weapons and marked a grim chapter in wartime history. The sky lit up with burning buildings' fires, casting a haunting glow over the streets. People spent sleepless nights in bomb shelters, cramped and anxious, listening to the distant sounds of anti-aircraft guns and the closer, terrifying whistles of falling bombs. The mornings revealed the devastation, rows of houses reduced to rubble, landmarks destroyed and lives lost. During the day, Londoners attempted to maintain a semblance of everyday life amidst the chaos. They went to work, queued for rations and volunteered for war efforts. Keep calm and carry on was more than a slogan. It was a mantra necessary for survival. Communities banded together, sharing resources and comfort. The Blitz created a strange dichotomy in their lives, fear and fortitude, despair and defiance. Just as the city began to recover and a false sense of safety settled in, Hitler introduced a new terror, the V-1 and V-2 bombings starting in 1944. These were arguably more terrifying as they arrived without warning, their deadly payloads delivered by unmanned flying bombs and rockets, the first of their kind. The psychological impact was immense. There was no time to seek shelter, no way to prepare. The random nature of these attacks meant no one felt safe anywhere in the city. The V-1 flying bomb, infamously dubbed the Doodlebug, introduced a novel form of terror to the skies of World War II. Its menacing buzz was more than just a sound. It was a harbinger of death. The noise filled the air with dread, and its abrupt cessation was a grim signal of an imminent explosion. In stark contrast, the V-2 rocket, a supersonic weapon of destruction, struck silently its approach undetected until its devastating impact. This contrast in auditory signatures between the two weapons amplified the unpredictability and fear among the civilian population. Hitler's V weapons, the V1 and V2, were crafted with a sinister purpose, to conduct terror bombings in retaliation for the Allied bombing campaigns on German cities during the later stages of World War II. London, as a primary target, bore the brunt of these attacks. The intention was clear, to instill terror among British civilians, eroding public morale to the point of potentially forcing Britain to withdraw from the war. The V-1, conceptualized in the 1930s, began materializing in late 1943 with launch sites emerging in northern France. This world's first operational cruise missile, launched from an inclined ramp or occasionally from aircraft, resembled a pilotless small aircraft. Its pulse jet engine, while loud, propelled it to speeds of up to 400 miles per hour, allowing it to traverse the English Channel within minutes. Initially, the V-1 had a range of about 160 miles, which was later extended to approximately 200 miles. The V-1 was equipped with a rudimentary autopilot system. A small propeller at the front measured the distance traveled. Once a preset distance was reached, the engine would cut out, sending the V-1 and its one-ton explosive payload into a steep, uncontrolled dive. Due to this primary guidance mechanism, the V-1 was notoriously inaccurate, rendering it more effective against large areas rather than specific targets. As Winston Churchill poignantly expressed to the Parliament in the summer of 1944, quote, London is, therefore, the unique target of the world for the use of a weapon of such gross inaccuracy. 
The flying bomb is a weapon literally and essentially indiscriminate in its nature, purpose and effect. The first V-1 was launched towards Britain on June 13, 1944, just a week after the Allies' historic D-Day landings in Normandy. This initiated a relentless summer campaign, with nearly 10,000 flying bombs hurtling towards the British Isles. The impact was significant, over 6,000 deaths, 18,000 wounded, and countless displaced, their homes destroyed. Although the scale of destruction was not as extensive as the 1940-1941 Blitz, the psychological impact was profound, leading over a million people to flee London, seeking refuge from Hitler's new weapon of terror. Faced with this unprecedented threat, the British launched Operation Diver, a series of countermeasures involving barrage balloons, anti-aircraft guns, and fighter planes. These defences gradually evolved, becoming increasingly influential as the bombing campaign progressed. This period saw a resurgence of RAF's daring feats over British soil, reminiscent of the heroism displayed during the Battle of Britain in mid-1940. Arthur Umbers, a New Zealand RAF fighter pilot, recounts a harrowing moment as he faced off against a V-1 doodlebug. Out at sea, near Dover, looming 3,000 feet above, the V-1 was a speck of doom. Umbers, in a lethal dive, positioned himself directly behind the flying bomb. At 400 yards, he unleashed a burst of gunfire. The V-1, undeterred, hurtled on. Umbers closed in, firing again. In an instant, the V-1 transformed from a menacing drone to an inferno of orange flame and choking black smoke. Umbers couldn't escape its fiery grasp. His aircraft jolted violently, tossing him upside down. Battling for control, he flipped his plane back, narrowly escaping with his life. By the autumn of 1944, the tide was turning. Radar-based anti-aircraft technology, armed with proximity fuses and the British double-cross system feeding the Nazis' lies about V-1 accuracy, were crippling the impact of these terror-bringers. Duncan Sandys of the British War Cabinet boldly declared to the press on September 7th, quote, the Battle of London is over. His words, dripping with premature triumph, were shattered the very next day. Hitler's ruthless response, the V-2, a weapon of unprecedented destruction. The V-2 rocket was a harbinger of a new era of warfare. Towering at 46 feet, this long-range ballistic missile, powered by a liquid propellant engine and guided by gyroscopes and rudders, soared to the edge of space before plummeting at supersonic speeds toward its target. Defenseless against this sky-borne predator, Britain could only watch as it delivered destruction from above, up to 200 miles away. At the heart of this technological terror was Werner von Braun. A man driven by a childhood dream of spaceflight, he was snatched up by the military to turn his vision into a weapon of war. The V-2, born from his genius, only produced suffering. In the concealed hell of Mittelbau Dora concentration camp, 60,000 prisoners toiled in underground tunnels, constructing these rockets. No daylight, no rest, and inhumane conditions. Saboteurs were executed, their bodies displayed as a gruesome warning. Despite von Braun's V-2 raining destruction on Britain, causing 2,700 casualties, the war's end saw his fortunes change dramatically. Spirited away to the US, he pivoted from crafting instruments of war to pioneering the Saturn V rocket, a cornerstone of America's lunar ambitions. Yet the V-2's legacy was a double-edged sword, Expensive and resource-intensive, it drained Nazi Germany at a crucial time. It was a wake-up call for the Allies, a technological leap they couldn't ignore. If these rockets couldn't be intercepted, they had to be destroyed at their source. A race against time and technology ensued a desperate quest to neutralize a threat that loomed like a shadow over the future of warfare. In 1943, a year before London would reel under Hitler's V-weapons, Allied intelligence pierced the shroud over northern France, unveiling the first of eleven shadowy German megastructures. With six dedicated to the dreaded V-2 rocket, these ominous constructs marked a sinister turn in the war. By November, a bone-chilling discovery. 96 ski sites, the launch pads for the fearsome V-1 flying bomb, emerged from the fog of war. Inside the war rooms, an electric tension hung in the air. Officials wrestled with the menacing enigma of these German weapons. They fiercely debated if they were mere decoys, a cunning ruse to divert Allied bombers, or if they harboured a deeper, more malevolent purpose. Fears of chemical or biological payloads loomed large in hushed conversations. Then, a surge of vital intelligence flooded in from an unexpected source, Cassia, 
an Austrian resistance group led by the courageous priest Heinrich Meyer. Their daring espionage stripped bare the secrets of the V1, V2, and the Peenemünde facility, including the critical Raxwerker production sites. Galvanized by this revelation, the War Cabinet Defense Committee with Churchill at the helm leaped into action. In a tense June meeting, Churchill declared, quote, Peenemünde is beyond our radio navigation reach. Moonlit bombing is our only option, despite lurking German night fighters and our own absence. Yet we must strike with all our might. Operation Hydra, the first coordinated assault on Peenemünde in August 1943, marked a pivotal moment in this shadow war. To maximize bombing precision and minimize collateral damage, the British chose a full moon night at an altitude of 2,400 meters. The aim was to strike hard, yet spare civilian lives, targeting the living quarters of scientists and engineers. On the nights of 17 and the 18th of August, a powerful force of 500 bombers, led by Captain John Searby's British 83 Squadron, descended upon Peenemünde. The cost was steep. 215 air crews and 40 bombers were lost against the Luftwaffe's 12 night fighters. Over 170 civilians perished, including key scientists and engineers, yet the facility stood unbroken. In a cunning move, the Germans camouflaged Peenemünde's resilience. Scientist Siegfried Winter recalled, I quote, We clambered onto roofs, painting black and white lines to mimic charred beams. This deception aimed to mislead Allied reconnaissance. Despite the lack of permanent damage, Operation Hydra's success lay in its strategic ripple effect. It compelled the Germans to abandon fixed launch sites, shifting to mobile V-2 platforms. This raid birthed Operation Crossbow, a relentless Allied crusade to obliterate the Nazis' veiled V-2 launch facilities. As 1944 dawned, Hitler's V-weapon program teetered on the edge of unleashing terror. Originally slated for a January launch, a German high command inspection in October exposed delays in construction, training and V-1 supplies. Yet the looming threat magnified. French intelligence, fused with stark aerial images, unveiled a nightmare scenario. The capacity to unleash 2,000 missiles on England daily. By year's end, over half of the 96 sites were primed for war. In a bold counter-move, on April 19, 1944, General Eisenhower, spurred by the British War Cabinet, shifted the gears of aerial warfare. He declared Operation Crossbow aimed at crippling the V-weapon menace as the overriding priority. This sweeping directive sidelined even the strategic bombing of German industries and efforts to crush civilian morale. This radical pivot highlighted the dire menace these weapons posed. The urgency of Eisenhower's command crystallized when the V-1 barrage commenced on the night of June 12-13, 1944. In a crucial exchange with Arthur Tedder, Eisenhower stressed that crossbow targets eclipsed all else, save for the immediate needs of Operation Overlord, the Normandy invasion. This unwavering focus on neutralizing the V-weapon threat persisted until Allied dominance in this critical war front was indisputable. Despite this, Britain reeled under up to 100 missile strikes daily. These relentless attacks blindsided the Allies, shattering their belief in the success of earlier countermeasures. The British, particularly, were rattled, not foreseeing such intense German bombardments so late in the war. Desperate measures surfaced, including gas attacks on launch sites and even the grim proposal of executing German civilians in retaliation. Meanwhile, the Wehrmacht feverishly worked on Site System 1, 96 fixed launch sites masquerading as innocuous as key facilities. Two more systems, including the colossal Wasserwerk, Waterworks bunkers, were in the pipeline. The Allies responded with fury. In early December, USAAF Martin B-26 marauders spearheaded the assault, with RAF Bomber Command amplifying the devastation under night's cover. The inaccuracies of night bombing soon led to a strategic shift, US heavy bombers taking the reins by day. By the close of December, the onslaught had battered 54 sites, utterly destroying seven. The campaign intensified. By March's end, nine sites lay in ruins, 35 critically damaged. By May, 24 sites were annihilated, 58 severely compromised. In the aftermath of Operation Hydra, targeted crossbow strikes dismantled the heavy crossbow bunkers at Watton and Mimoyex. December 5th signaled the start of crossbow operations against ski sites, codenamed Noble. Each target was hit with unyielding precision, a testament to the Allies' resolve to crush the shadow of Hitler's V-weapon program. 
In a bid to match efforts, the US forged its own crossbow committee in early 1944, led by General Stephen Henry. This team honed bombing strategies for V-1 ski sites at the Air Corps Proving Ground, refining tactics for maximum impact, a bold plan by the US Marine Corps for an air raid from aircraft carriers targeting V-1 launch sites was stymied by inter-service rivalry. Undeterred, the Allied bombing campaign escalated, turning its sights on smaller V-2 facilities, including storage depots and liquid oxygen plants. Key strikes, the August 4th raid on the Mary sur oise V-2 depot and the August 25th assault on Belgian cryogenic plants, struck vital blows to the German war engine. Despite these successes, Operation Crossbow's challenge was daunting. The sheer number of facilities and their cunning concealment made it a prolonged, gruelling campaign that persisted until the war's end. Missile attacks on Britain waned, but the threat lingered. Had it not been for Crossbow and the valiant efforts of Allied airmen, who obliterated V-weapon factories and launch sites, the scale of devastation these weapons could have wrought is unimaginable, the bravery and resolve of these men averted a catastrophe of unfathomable proportions, safeguarding countless lives. Operation Crossbow's success owed much to an emerging, unlikely, yet revolutionary technology, 3D photography. In 1943, British reconnaissance aircraft, using stereoscopic cameras, captured the first images of the 96 V-1 and V-2 rocket sites, this stereoscopic technique, rendering the enemy landscape in three dimensions, was a game-changer. These images were pivotal for British photographic interpreters. The 3D effect, revealing height and depth, unveiled hidden structures and launch sites scattered across Europe. This ability to discern intricate details often missed in 2D images was instrumental in identifying the menacing V1 and V2 facilities among countless German constructions. The technical process was intricate. Images had to overlap by 60% to produce a 3D effect when viewed through a stereoscope. This technique was crucial in halting the devastation wrought by the potent V2 rockets. British Spitfires of the Photographic Reconnaissance Unit were at the forefront, taking millions of photographs to create highly detailed maps. These Spitfires, stripped of armaments to accommodate five cameras, flew at 9,000 meters. Their pilots, Jimmy Taylor, the unit's sole surviving member, took pride in their non-combat role. Taylor, at 88 years old, told the BBC, quote, We had no guns, no bullets, so I didn't kill anyone, but the photographs are still with us and they're still useful. From late 1943 to Germany's surrender in May 1945, Allied bombers relentlessly targeted the 96 sites. It's estimated that without the effectiveness of these 3D pictures, the V-2 rockets could have claimed over 9,000 lives. Alan Williams, curator of the National Collection of Aerial Photography, highlighted to the BBC, quote, Without this photographic intelligence, the Germans could have launched potentially devastating attacks on Britain before D-Day. Moreover, the early sorties of Operation Crossbow, including Operation Hydra, were crucial. They potentially thwarted the use of V-1 and V-2 attacks that could have disrupted the Normandy landings, potentially prolonging the war. Experts concur that even without Crossbow, the V-2 rocket alone couldn't have turned the war in Germany's favour. The V-2, effective and unopposed initially, arrived too late to alter the war's course. Yet its legacy is profound. Combined with the birth of nuclear weapons, it demonstrated that ballistic missiles were the future's paramount weapons, with the V-2 as the progenitor. Post-war, the V-2 program's remnants became a coveted prize for both the Soviets and Allies. The earliest Soviet and American ballistic missiles during the Cold War were V-2 derivatives. German scientists, including Werner von Braun, were instrumental in developing weapons for the US and the USSR. Ultimately, von Braun's expertise propelled the US space program, culminating in NASA's lunar landing in 1969.